The Radwood Car Show is coming back to Southern California and it's gonna be their first car show in the area in two years. And if you know me, you're fully aware that I'm a huge fan of the cars from the 80s and 90s and I absolutely have to go to the show. I've already got quite a few eligible cars from the era, but most were super cheap projects that have multiple issues. My Nova needs new wheel bearings and brakes. The probe overheated and it's now running like garbage. My YJ needs just about everything. The Previa might just have a failing head gasket. Liam Nissan needs a new engine. So what does that mean? Should I stay up all night wrenching on one of these cars to get it ready for the show? No, of course not. Don't be silly. Let's go buy another cheap car. All right, here's what I got. A 1992 Ford F-150 flare side. Ninety-two is the first year of the ninth generation Ford F-150 with ever so slightly more rounded edges and this flare side with its narrow bed and fiberglass fenders was actually marketed as a personal truck and not a work truck. Ford's slogan for the flare side was a truck with a personality as unique as your own, which is pretty cringy, but I bet there was a contingent of baby boomers that wanted to look cool when they dropped their Gen X kids off at school, but it does look pretty rad in kind of an old fashioned way. Like most of my purchases, it was an impulse buy. My neighbor was selling it. But enough about this new flare side. I'll do more videos with this truck soon. The Radwood show is starting in just about an hour, so I better get over there. And if you know me, I can't just go to a Radwood 80s and 90s car show dressed like a normal person. I've got to step it up a notch. All right, let's go. All right, so I've arrived at Radwood SoCal. I am super excited, as you might know, because I love this show. It's basically my favorite car show ever. The show hasn't even technically started yet, but it's just an amazing sight. So many incredible cars. I don't know where to look first. I'm literally giddy with excitement. In 1989, it was the last year that Shelby was gonna work with Dodge. So they went balls to the wall. They added a VNT turbocharger, composite wheels. It's got the Shelby interior, the body kit by Kaminari. It's just a really, really fun car. And I always wanted a Shelby. I've been priced out of every other Shelby, but these ones, sure. and they're just as fun as any other Shelby you can get. It's been a great car. All I had to do is change out the steering rack on it, and it drives like a dream. Interior is perfect on it. That's what I wanted. I, I was looking for that perfect Shelby interior with the Recaro seats and I eventually found one. I liked that this car was so unique. It's the first for a lot of things. They're okay. rare. It, it just fit all of my little like, sure. requirements. So how is it to drive? Oh, it's great. It's, yeah. like, it's like driving a go-kart on the street. <laughs> I remember that. Nice. It really is. Even though it's front wheel drive, it handles great. It's peppy. You do not want to take this thing over 100 miles per hour. <laughs> they claimed that they talked it out at 156. Okay. I believe that whoever did that put itself a ton of danger. <laughs> After sure. about 80 miles, you're really feeling the wind on this Okay. Car. And how many of these do they make? This 500. 500. Mine's 500. number 336. What's under the hood? What kind of power does this make? It's a four-cylinder with a VNT turbo. It makes yeah. 175 horsepower okay. with 205 torque. I can't remember. What is this based on? It's a Dodge Shadow. Shadow. Thank you. As far as Shelby was concerned, you had the Shelby Lancer. Yeah. You had the Shelby CSX. Yeah. You had the GLHS. You had the Charger GLHS. And then you had the truck, which was a Dakota. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, there's underappreciated. I agree. And I just bought this like six or eight months ago. 40 some thousand original mile car from a neighbor. Used to walk the dogs by and uh, just loved it and uh, love it's like the only modular car ever made. I think Mazda and Mercedes both toyed with modularity of cars and this is the only one that was ever produced and probably the only one that will ever be produced that's modular that you could get a metal coupe back, you could get a fiberglass sport back with a K. 
you could get a canvas or, or vinyl back, or you could leave it open as a small truck or convertible. Love the engineering, and I love that this has not been kind of boy racered out. It's got the original 13-inch wheels yes. and, and hubcaps. But yeah, it's it's super bone stock original. I'm a kind of a car collector, so I've got like 50s cars, 60s cars, yeah. 70s cars. I just got into, you know, through your videos, and, Sweet. and Doug is in San Diego, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. watching some of his stuff about the 80s cars. You know, I never thought these cars would be collectible. I always thought they're just plastic and they're not going to last. But um, I really appreciate the design and the aesthetics. And now that you can, you know, um, 3D print some of the plastic stuff and, you you know, there's a following for them. I, uh, I really wanted to get one before I couldn't afford them. Yeah. And a 40,000 mile original car is wow. the way to buy them. You know, it's a sporty car. It's not a sport car. It's 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 not fast. It was the modularity of the design, you know, like uh, that really uh, intrigued me about it. And the tail lights. I mean, it's got oh, the tail all the 80s, are great. the pop-up headlights, T-tops, flush door handles. It's the trifecta of 80s. Yeah, totally. It's <laughs> got like every 80s thing built into one. When I was in high school, I thought the taillights looked kind of funny, you know, in the early 90s, but now it just captures the, the zeitgeist or the, the feel of the era, and I, uh, I just appreciated it. I've seen this Spirit RT like five times and I've never seen the owner. I desperately want to talk to the owner of this car because it is probably the cleanest Spirit RT in existence. I don't even know if there's that many of them, but this one is perfect. This is a 1988 M6. It's the last M6 that BMW brought into the US for that era. And how long have you had it? You were saying that you haven't had it that long, right? Yeah, only about six months. So it's new to us and we finally got to dress up for it. Yes, yes, you have to dress your part when you come to Rowett, right? You guys did the right thing. It's an excuse, thing. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what drew you to this particular car? A friend, somebody spotted it in a garage and they said, you have to look at this car. It's like traveling back in time. It's a time capsule preserved vehicle you need to see it and coincidentally they were wanting to sell it so we made a deal a little bit after that and how is it to drive it's wonderful I mean you know it's it's an older car so yeah. things have improved since then but for the time it's amazing today driving on the freeway it does have more power than the average car so yeah it's, it's a joy to drive it's comfortable fast it's as much as you can throw in one car yeah pretty zippy I've had to follow him before in it and it's fast <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, it's a DX, so base model prelude, our original California car, purchased an Anaheim Hardin Honda in 87 from an older couple. Yep. It was their second Honda prelude. I think they had a first gen, like a red one. According to the lady who I tracked down after 30 something years, she said it was her husband's favorite car oh. and uh, sold it to a cousin, I believe, who sold it somewhere else. And I found it in El Monte. It has dual carburetors, so those need to be rebuilt. I redid the AC system, um, replaced few hoses there, put in the factory equalizers. So just a lot of like cosmetic and accessory things. But all in all, it's been a great car. And um, I'm just really happy to, to have it. And you just don't see these Hondas anymore, and especially these carburetors one so I'm really grateful that I was I stumbled upon it sure so what drew you to this particular car or what drew you to Honda yeah Honda well, uh, in my dad over there he yep. um, when he buys a car always has to have a sunroof <laughs> yeah Preludes, as some people know, yeah. are standard with a sunroof from factory. Yeah. And I wanted to hone in my skills on a manual transmission. Okay. So this car checked both our boxes, had a factory sunroof yeah. and a 5C manual. Okay. So after that, I said, we have to go check it out. And I, when I saw it, I just kind of fell in love and said, take my money. <laughs> <laughs> are you a fan of cars from this era? Yes, I, yeah. I've always been into cars. I think now that I've grown up, it's more like aid Malaise era, so late 70s, early okay. 80s. Yeah. And then for some reason, these Hondas, like these golden era Hondas, as I call them, are really speaking to me. Yeah. Sure. I just I love the the like ergonomic, the analog feel, and sometimes simplicity too. Yeah, they're just they're just a hoot to drive. So much fun. Yes, and you have pop up headlights, which pop -up is headlights, wonderful. Yes, and of course. these wheels are amazing. These originals Those were no. These okay. were uh, I found these online through a Facebook group. They were new old stock that a person had in a box for like 30 years. They're 14 inches, and the originals are hubcaps, which are 13. And so I bought them and I put them on and kind of held my breath that the people who were putting them on didn't scratch them up. You know, <laughs> installing new old stock wheels. But yeah, they present really well and they really 
give the car an extra flair. My sure. Opinion. So how is it to drive? Kind of bumpy, you know. It's, okay. it's, a, it's a small car, low to the ground, but it's very, very nippy in corners. A lot of people uh, compare it to a go kart. Yeah. I'd say so. Yeah. Um, I don't go that fast, yeah. but it's definitely really fun to drive, in my opinion. This is Ingrid. I am the third owner of this 1986 Volkswagen Cabriolet. I've had it yep. for 13 years. Looks stock and is completely not. It was a blue car with a black top. The first owner changed it from blue to white. The second owner changed the top from black to blue and I've swapped out a whole new interior. I used to have a GTI and it fills that void. She's a garage queen, comes out for Sunday sh shows and cars and coffee and touring tourists around LA. So yeah. where did the name Ingrid come from? The previous owner. Previous she owner, said okay. she wanted to give it a good German name, but not Helga. <laughs> so she gave it Ingrid, and I kept Ingrid because it, I think it's appropriate. So what drew you to this particular car? It was clean. Okay. It was clean and cheap. All right. Um, I wanted a convertible since I had just moved to Los Angeles, and I wanted an old air-cooled Volkswagen, but I didn't have the money even 13 years ago for one, and this was considerably cheaper than anything air-cooled. And much more drivable in LA traffic, frankly. It's much more of a real car. I mean, it's got disc brakes and actual seat belts. I'm, I'm quite happy with it. Saab 900 SPG. SPG is Special Performance Group, which in other countries was called Aero. It's an 87, which was actually the year they facelifted the 900, but mine does not have the facelift. It was in an accident probably about 15 years ago, and I think got backdated at that point. So I just finished redoing the interior, and my next project is to unbackdate the exterior. I have all the parts to do it, I just didn't have time uh, before coming down here. Bought the car in July, and have been really busy with it ever since. It's a blast to drive, it's a total like mongrel under the hood, but it actually runs super well, it's really fast. So what drew you to this car in particular? Have you always been interested in Saabs? I noticed you have a Saab, I have jacket, a Saab jacket, so you are yeah. representing. So. <laughs> yeah. Actually, a former neighbor, when we bought the car, saw that I had gotten it and said, I have this jacket, do you want it? And just dropped it on our doorstep. It was the most amazing thing. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I've always liked Saabs, and my mom had one when I was a kid, so there's a little bit of a connection there. Johnny really likes Saabs, so it was sort of like a car that we both were interested in, and this is just different. Right, like it's, yeah. it's kind of it was the off-brand choice at the time. <laughs> sure, <laughs> or not off-brand, but maybe yeah. off-beat. Oh man, we have to take a look at this incredibly clean Cadillac Fleetwood. I haven't seen one this clean ever. This is my 1991 Cadillac Fleetwood Coupe, one of only 894 made that year. I got it a couple years ago from Georgia. I actually bought it sight unseen. You did? <laughs> it seemed fine. I called him back so I would buy it, and he's like, I just sold it. Oh no! I'm like, oh. You know, he's like, I'm so sorry, but you know, I needed the money. I'm like, okay, fine. And then like three days after that, he called me and he's like, you know what? The guy, the guy who bought it, he can't even get me a deposit. So you know, if you oh, want okay. it, it's yours. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe this was. You know, God telling me this is not the car. He's like, well, maybe it's God telling you this is the car. So I was like, okay. So I've had it repainted. This is the original color. New roof. It's kind of the wrong color because they don't make the color anymore that it's supposed to be. Sure. I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and yeah. so vinyl roofs and coach lamps, you know, kids wanted Ferraris, I had Cadillacs and Lincolns. This is kind of like the end of the era for this, you know, a big two-door with all dressed up. And I always think it looks like a teenage kid playing in grandma's closet. <laughs> you know, it's, all, like, yeah. it's not big enough to be, you know, a big Cadillac, but it's, sure. it's trying to be. It's trying to be. So this is actually I got from a, a buddy of mine. Yeah. So and uh, we've kind of co-owned this car for some years. I'm now the custodian of it. So uh, shout out to Dustin for that. It's been in California now for about a year. Before okay. Before that, it was back down south where we're from. This is the original color you're saying? Yes. This is a fantastic color. Yes, Aztec Pearl Green is the factory color. Have you always been into Acuras? Or? Uh, you know what's funny is uh, my very first car was a uh, 88 Acura Integra sedan that I had for about maybe three months and I got rear-ended and slammed into the front of another car oh, and it was totaled. And after that, they just kind of steamrolled. I had a couple sedans and I had a couple of these before 
before. I had this car and I even had some of the later models, but this one was actually always the most reliable model. Okay. Never broke down, never caused me any trouble. I mean, I've, I've driven literally tens of thousands of miles in, in this model without a problem. So, uh, you know, these became really unloved for a long period of time and this one's just a survivor. So it's the original B17 engine that's kind of limited for these cars. Uh -huh. And these were limited production numbers, which a lot of people don't know. So they're even less of these produced than the actual Integra Type R. There's one up on the lawn there. Uh, it's a little more stock. Mine's a little different. <laughs> sure. But, uh, but nonetheless, you know, that's what kind of stuck me to it. It was when it comes to having a car that you want you don't want it to break down that's number one so what have what have you done to it so I, I had uh, the engine rebuilt uh, so that it could handle boost so it's forged internals high compression there's a lot of uh, it's head work done valve springs lifters retainers camshafts block guard a transmission is limited slip fully built the biggest thing is it's turbocharged and since the engines built is uh, standalone engine management can handle 25 pounds of boost at max Wow it's about 650 horse that's impressive. It's so would you say little. it's uh, <laughs> kind of fun to drive? Just a little, just a little. <laughs> Sweet, it looks awesome. The color is great. It's in really good condition too. Yeah. Now being at the Honda campus here in Torrance, the selection of Acura Integras that they have on display is pretty insane. But there's this Accord wagon up there that I absolutely love. We gotta go take a look at it. Pretty much don't care that it's a race car, don't care that it only has one seat. I would daily drive the crap out of that car. This is my uh, 1984 Nissan 50th Anniversary 300ZX Turbo. And I love this car. It was actually my first car. I saw one of these when I was like 14 in 1992. And I saved up a lot and bought this one in 1995. Wow. So 26 years and I've kept it all this time. I just love it. That's it's incredible. A really fun car. You know, like a lot of folks, you know, my favorite movie was Back to the Future and you know, something about the DeLorean and a yep. silver two-seater sports car was kind of cool. And, and I remember seeing this and saying, oh, it kind of reminds me of a DeLorean a little bit. And then a, a buddy of mine had one and took me for a ride and I was like blown away by the digital dashboard. Yes, which looks exactly. like my t-shirt here today. Yeah. But the digital dash is just bonkers. Yes. And, it, and this idea of like in the early 80s trying to make something look as advanced as possible. Yes. You know, seeing like sort of like what they thought the future would be like back in the early 80s is really fascinating. So what makes the, the 50th anniversary special? So it's 50th anniversary of Nissan, not of the Z car. Z yep. car started in 1970, model year. The most noticeable is the two-tone paint. It has 16 inch wheels that are gold accented it has wider fenders in the front to accommodate that and fender extensions in the rear to accommodate those 16 inch wheels first time for a z car mm -hmm. with that it has unique interior so the seats are a little bit different it has unique stereo with a body sonic amplifier they called it which Fancy. is the most ridiculous feature nissan ever did <laughs> only on the anniversary edition and it pulses uh your back oh as that's you go. awesome it's factory in stock it's super cool mirror finish on the t-tops yeah and they were all built this way same color scheme, all the options. The only thing choice you had was a was the five-speed manual or four-speed automatic, and mine is a stick. Yep. Um, all the pinstriping on the side. This is factory original, and then the pinstriping on the front and rear bumpers is factory replica. And then all the other stuff that's hand painted that was done before I got the car in 1995. So I think somewhere around the late 1980s, those pinstripes were put on, and it's clear coated over, so I'm kind of stuck with it until yes. I repaint the car. <laughs> but uh, I didn't like them for years, but now I um, yeah I really do it just makes it unique and different and, for sure uh, and kind of fun and period correct so the side rear hatch louvers are dealer accessory the headlight louvers are accessory and then it's got a pretty rare caminari tailpiece on the back which was also i believe i think the dealer put on all that stuff when the car was new but otherwise the powertrain is stock and the suspension's just been updated a little bit with modern stuff um, for drivability since you've had this car for so long do you have a lot of stories around like where you've taken it and places and events yeah my whole life yeah I and mean, uh you know i i drove this car to my senior prom wow. in high school i drove it you know when i started college you know as i got older um my uh girlfriend now wife and i you know we started driving in, in this thing um, when we first started dating and 
you know, she used to make fun of me about it. She still does. Um, Why? I, what what is know, there to make fun of? Because it's just ridiculous. It's like, it's, you know, it's it's over the top. And it the, is. The design and yeah. the accents and everything. And now my son and I, he's old enough, he can ride in the passenger seat. And, uh, you know, it's just sort of like, I can never get rid, I can't get rid of this thing. No, you can't can now. I can get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah, you've, you've had so many yeah. stories with it. I, I think yeah. it'd be tough to get rid of. Yeah. So the one thing I really like about Radwoods is that you've got cars like Testarossa's parked right next to something like a Toyota Corolla Alltrack. And I'm generally tend to be more interested in something like the Alltrack. So let's go take a look. The 88 Corolla Alltrack, the previous generation was a Tercel four-wheel drive, discontinued in 87. These were introduced in 88. It's full-time four-wheel drive with a center locking diff. So it's pretty cool. What I have on it, like for suspension wise, it's pretty low. In front I have max feeding rod coilovers and in the rear I'm running Swift Techno Toy lowering springs. I have a parcel tray here for it. There's actual speakers left and right and here there's an actual storage tray. Uh, you can see here. Oh that's so cool. You can open and like put stuff in there and then you can also open it from the other end too and like for the people in the back. That is so yeah, cool. I didn't know that. Uh, I put a sub in there. Okay. So fun thing to install. So sure yeah, it's, it's a fun toy. I bought it in Washington and I actually flew up there and then I drove it down. You drove down? Yeah, so it was, it was a lot of fun. So what drew you to this car? Was there something specific about it that you really liked? Yeah, the all-wheel drive feature. Okay. Like the full-time four-wheel drive, that and uh, I love wagons. So okay. wagons are a thing for me that I really enjoy seeing. Yeah. And was the uh, strut bike race uh, aftermarket? Would that uh, come with it's it? It's from uh, 892 GTS. Okay. It's a Corolla yeah. GTS too as yeah. well. Yeah. And then here, there's these window inserts. Yeah. So they have the Sprinter Carib. Since there's the Sprinter, it's known as the Cielo, the Treno. This is the Carib for them. They're very popular in Russia because of their four-wheel drive capabilities. So I was able to find some of the inserts for it as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah, also the spoiler too. Oh and yeah, you gotta get the spoiler. Was that yeah. original or uh, no? So they did come with a spoilers, but except the US market didn't get a light up spoiler. Okay. Some guy in Russia sent it to me and it has a, a spoiler lights up. Yeah, yeah so that's pretty awesome. Cool. This is the first production car with a composite chassis. What that means is it's a carbon foam core construction that was autoclaved in a boat factory in Florida. The second commercial application under $100,000 on a road going vehicle was 25 years later with the BMW i3. Warren Mosler was a visionary. There's a lot of concepts on this car that could have been imparted into the general automotive production. This car was one of the safest cars on the road from crashworthiness. It doesn't even have accordion bumpers in an era where that was mandated. It's super light. This car gets over 30 miles to the gallon on the freeway. <laughs> oh, wow. So it's way more fuel efficient technology. It's safer. But the drawback to it was that it was less profitable. The consensus among like the big three automakers is that this car is beating us on the racetrack. It's making us look bad. And we don't want to have to build a car to compete against it because it's less profitable to us. Even though it's better for the environment, it's better for, for the consumer, it's better for everybody else but the automaker. So they systematically took steps to get the car banned from competition, to have it uh, blasted in the media where these other companies were spending a lot of money advertising. So they're like, man, this car's making us look like fools. We don't want you to make a good review about it, anything like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of cronyism that really shut down the concept of this car. And some people might say, oh, well, it's ugly or it's this or it's that, or they should have done this differently design. And I think one of the really special things about this car is it was not built by a committee. It was built by one guy going, what's the way to build this car as light and as aerodynamic as possible yep. and fit somebody who's six foot five in the interior without rubbing their head on the seal. Those were the design criteria for the car. It was a comfortable cabin and everything else was as race car as you can get in terms of concept there. If you look at this car from above, it has the exact same profile as like an IMSA prototype from a later era. I think that that's really special because most production cars have uh, concessions to be able to sell cars, but it makes it all the more special. Somebody went and said, we're going to completely change the status quo and build something that's completely revolutionary. And they've won a lot of races doing it and to have it as a street car that I could drive around and 
drop my kid off to school in. It's yeah. Awesome. I just put spark plugs in this. It cost me eight dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so the the fact that you have a car that that is very exotic, but also uses components that can be bought over the counter at any auto sure. parts store. So yes, the suspension is a like a bespoke you know piece, but it uses Dodge Chrysler minivan ball joints. So it made yeah. the car very approachable from an ownership standpoint because I'm not afraid to break it because I can fix it and it's very easy to work on and it's it's actually the most reliable and the most fuel efficient car that I own. So, <laughs> How many do they make? They made 81 chassis. Okay. 25 became race cars and 38 became VIN titled road cars. So this was number 16. So it was the last of the series one cars. What engine does this have? Because you said the spark plugs were cheap. So, so what's under let's the... check it out. Yep. Chrysler uh, Dodge Shelby Turbo powertrains. So it's a Dodge Omni GLHS. This is actually a Series 2, so it's the Dodge Daytona powertrain basically. And what's interesting is everybody says, oh, why a four-cylinder, all of that stuff. They wanted to sell this as a production car that was 50 state smog legal. They were looking at something like a Corvette, an LT4 at the time at 215 horsepower. With the shorter exhaust and everything like that and a little chip tuning, they were putting out 200 stock out of these cars in that same era where an LT4 with a huge packaging issue that would have made the car longer and heavier and all of these things, yeah. there was a 15 horsepower difference between those. The reason for it is that this was the best power to weight ratio of any powertrain available in the US at the time. So that's what they used and then they used all the other Chrysler components to make it serviceable. Like if I blow up this transmission, there's a uh, Dodge minivan manual here that I could literally steal a, a transmission out of and use it. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. It's actually a very comfortable interior. I, I'm very tall like you. It's got a ton of legroom in there. Yeah, there is a lot of legroom. Even though it's kind of cool to be at a car show in this car, I really like the juxtaposition of it being in like a normal environment. So like yeah. on a Wednesday, I'll go drive my kid to school and drop her off to kindergarten in it. Yeah. And amongst the sea of, you know, black and white and gray SUVs, this thing's like a spaceship. This is my 1991 F-250 diesel. I got it in Bakersfield, California in February. Partially restored it. And as you can see here from my poster, that's what it originally looked like. Did a full paint correction. I did a little rattle can here and there. Okay. Uh, completely revamped the interior, painted all the door panels, the dash, redid the headliner, carpet. As with Radwood, it's dripping with nostalgia. So I wanted to get a vehicle that was uh, very similar to the one I learned to drive stick on. Okay. So it's my Grappos 87 F250. I found this one and said it fits the bill perfectly. I gotta have it. So this is the D, this is a 7.3? Yeah, 7.3 okay. non-turbo. Non-turbo, okay. So it's not exactly a quick car? No, it's <laughs> slower than hell. <laughs> it's still a truck. I still haul gravel in it, haul okay. wood. You know, I'm not gonna, it's not a museum piece. Uh, my whole thing with the home improvement, Benford Tools, yes. I wanted to match that because I grew up with that show. So I love gonna, it. I'm probably gonna take that off when I get home. <laughs> it's, it's still gonna be a truck. Yeah, okay, so that's, you're not keeping that? No. Okay. <laughs> that's just for the show. Just for the show, yeah. that's awesome. This is a 1989 Nissan Sentra base model. It's my first car to learn to drive the standard on. Is that why you got it? Or yes, and uh, my father had a similar car in 87. It's one of those cars that nobody cares about, but it's rare, but it's not valuable. It's one of those vehicles that used to be on the roads all the time. Exactly. But now you just don't see them anymore. Exactly. Yeah. I, I have been getting comments like that for the umpteenth time this whole day. Yes. So what have you done to the car so far? A lot. Oh. New engine. The original engine, it was not worth saving because the uh, main block and the timing cover was cracked. So hence it was bleeding oil profusely upon startup. I called from coast to coast finding, the, finding this same engine. This was the last one that they had available. I waited about three months or this whole summer to have the engine put in. I actually wanted to go to the Radwood up north in San Mateo, but yep. the car wasn't ready. What did you say your trunk is filled with? It filled to the brim with parts. <laughs> Well, then it's good to know that you're committed to the central lifestyle. You've got a lot of parts that you can kind of make this thing work.
So it's a 99, I bought it in March as my first car. I literally just got my license recently. Wait, my wait. mom's first car was actually a 96 Integra. And okay. She kept it until I was about three. And my mom was uh, talking to me about first cars and she was like, oh, you should get an Integra. Really? And after I looked into the, the heritage of the Integra, I really just loved the car okay. ever since. That's awesome. And you got a really nice looking one too. Yeah. Have you always liked cars from this era or was it just kind of a random thing that your mom suggested you get one? So I actually, I'm, I've liked cars of all eras. So yeah. my dad had a, a 68 C20 when I was a baby and he yeah. used it as a work truck. But that's how I got into cars. And he... So you, you think I'm gonna keep this car for a long time? I'm gonna try and keep it forever. That's awesome. So this is my 93 Geo Metro convertible. It's got about 180,000 miles on it now. This is my second Geo. I had like a 96 hatchback and I loved it. I fell in love with it. It blew up, I rebuilt the motor, I rebuilt the transmission. I basically like restored it. But this is uh, round two now. I moved to California about a year ago and bought this at the same time. I was not expecting the attention. <laughs> oh, really? I've okay. had, I've had uh, Skyline, I've had MR2s, I've had uh, actual like enthusiast cars yep. that didn't get nearly the attention this thing does. Like people will stop me on the road like is that a geo metro yeah yes <laughs> yeah, and i was already in like the geo game okay pretty pretty <laughs> far game. Yeah. so i was i was hooked i'm okay. one of the cult followers you know so there was that and then the fact that it was purple and it was convertible and i just moved to san diego i was like yeah <laughs> what, what else do you need? yeah exactly this is the perfect perfect car for the situation yeah and i was i already appreciated the nice the model. Yeah. so how is it to drive um it's rickety like um <laughs> there is a huge difference between the convertible and the uh the hard top like yeah. you drive over anything that's not perfectly flat and you just the chassis just flex but it's fun it's all part of the experience you know it's sketchy but sketchy in a good way in a good way yeah, yeah it's memorable All right, I think that's it for Radwood SoCal 2021. I saw some really awesome cars today. I talked to some amazing people and heard all their stories about their vehicles. I had so much fun. Thanks to everybody that talked to me today. And it looks like, man, I stayed to the bitter end. Everybody's gone. Where did everybody go? But as usual, Radwood is just such a fun show. Getting to see some amazing cars like Testarossas and Ferraris and Vipers, but having that juxtaposed to those economy cars from the 80s and 90s that you just don't see anymore. So yeah, Radwood, as usual, tons of fun can't wait to come to another one of these. If you like this video, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon. If you want to help support the show, maybe you can buy a Hello Road t-shirt. I've got my Nissan Pulsar Sportback shirt right here. If you have a Nissan Pulsar Sportback you want to sell to me, please let me know because I would like to buy one. I think that's going to be for today. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you're well and I'll see you soon.